Okay, the next item of business is the debate on motion 8686 in the name of Michael Mara on Scotland's financing and finances and the cost of living. I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I can advise the Chamber we have no time in hand and therefore all members will have to stick to their speaking time allocation. I'm sure you will lead by example. Uh, Michael Mara asks you to speak to move the motion for up to six minutes. Uh, Mr Mara. Thank you, President Officer, and I move the motion in my name. Uh, financial crisis is gripping families across Scotland. Soaring food prices, interest rates, energy and fuel prices, stubbornly high inflation driving the cost of daily life up and up. That scandal was turbocharged over those few fateful days in Downing Street last September by Liz Truss and Quasi Quarteng's disastrous mini-budget and the rest of the Tory party who backed them. There, we have a governing party that is morally bankrupt. Here, we have a governing party that's going bankrupt. Recent events have shown the depth of the culture of secrecy and cover-up that has festered at the heart of the SNP for years. The party treasurer resigned in 2021 over a lack of access to financial information. In any legitimate organisation, you would expect, resigning officer, the treasurer to be able to see the books. Fortunately, though, the continuity first minister does not believe the SNP is a criminal organisation. He has never had a burner phone. Expensive pens, pots and pans, jewellery, a fridge freezer. It's like the conveyor belt on the generation game. <laughs> no wonder the auditors resigned last year. And that too was hidden, even from their Westminster leader. Those auditors were concerned, and I quote presiding officer, as to the extent to which the audit was considered capable of detecting irregularities, including fraud. Yesterday lunchtime, Colin Beatty MSP was not capable of detecting a two-ton camper van, let alone fraud. By tea time, he had managed to recognise his own signature. In the approach of the SNP government, crucially, we find the same patterns of cover-up, secrecy and spin. Disingenuous tactics of dither and delay from this government meant the teacher's strike dragged on for far longer than parents, pupils or teachers could afford. For months, the Cabinet Secretary branded a deal unaffordable and unsustainable. Yet when our own constituents were targeted like a rabbit from a hat and the Cabinet Secretary found the money, extra money, but very light on detail. And that's familiar to members right across this chamber as typical of their approach to budgets. And the result of that haphazard budgeting is clear. Over £3.7 billion in wasted public money under the SNP. And don't just take my word for it. Audit Scotland have sounded the alarm for years about the opacity of this government's finance. A raft of reports and audits have criticised the government's lack of transparency. In their 2020-21 audit of Scottish Government Consolidated Accounts, Audit Scotland said that without greater transparency, it is difficult to form an overall picture of the performance of the Scottish Government. In November 2022, their report, titled Scotland's Public Finances, Challenges and Risks, said that a comprehensive and transparent assessment of the state of Scotland's public finances was needed. That warning was followed in December 2022 by the Audit of Scottish Government Consolidated Accounts, which stated the Scottish Government needs to do more to improve the quality and transparency, transparency of its financial and performance reporting. Take the infamous ferry contracts, President Officer. Audit Scotland said there was insufficient documentary evidence to explain why the decision was made to proceed with the contract. Audit Scotland's March 2022 report on arrangements to deliver vessels 801 and 802 was clear this government should, in quote, improve the transparency of its investment decisions. Just last month, Audit Scotland raised concerns about bonuses paid to senior managers at Ferguson Shipyard, stating it was, I quote again, not clear how their performance was assessed, nor were appropriate frameworks and governance in place. Yet more wasted money. No action from this government to stem the tide. We all remember that the SNP came to power on a promise from one of their disgraced former First Ministers to reduce the size of Cabinet and save the public money. But today we have a Cabinet of 10 and a further 18 Ministers, the biggest ever. The public purse holding together a party majority of which, a majority of which the party voted for the other two candidates. 
The public know they're not getting value for money. New figures published just this week from the Scottish Household Survey show satisfaction with public services plummeting. There is not a single institution in Scotland today that is stronger than it was 16 years ago. All have been weakened, some decimated by a perfect storm of 16 years of SNP incompetence and 13 years of Tory austerity. So while the SNP crumbles, the people of Scotland are paying the price for a distracted government mired in scandal. Ask the one in seven Scots on an NHS waiting list. Ask the teacher overwhelmed by workload. Ask the islanders whose livelihoods are destroyed. Nothing, nothing is working as it should. And the reason for that, presiding officer, is clear. A government that is rudderless, cast lazily adrift on an ocean of incompetence. But change is coming. The people will have their say in 2024 and in 2026. They can choose to elect a government that will restore competence, integrity and transparency to our public finances. They can choose to elect a government that will rebuild treasured institutions like our NHS for generations to come. They can choose to elect a Labour government that's the change that Scotland needs. Thank you, Mr. Mara. I now call Tom Arthur to speak to move Amendment 8686.2 up to five minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. As Parliament will be aware, last week we published our policy prospectus, New Leadership, a Fresh Start for Scotland, which sets out how, as a government, we will address the challenges that we face and build on our strengths. How we will drive equality, how we will seize the opportunities of an economy that is fair, green and growing, and how we will deliver for our communities with first-class public services to which we all aspire. We outlined the steps we will take over the course of this Parliament to deliver on this vision, and we are committed to routinely, regularly and transparently reporting on our performance against these aims and outcomes. As a government, we have been open and transparent with the Parliament on the fiscal challenges we are managing, both last year and as we developed the budget for this year. The ongoing impacts of the pandemic, soaring inflation caused by the war in Ukraine and exacerbated by Brexit, combined to create the most challenging financial situation ever experienced by this Parliament and indeed ever experienced by the people we are honoured to represent. Against this backdrop, we have successfully demonstrated careful budget management year after year, taking the hard decisions necessary to live within our means, despite the challenges faced. All Scottish Government spend is reported in our accounts, and these are audited against international accounting standards, not right now, against international accounting standards by Audit Scotland. The Auditor General's report on the 2021-22 accounts confirms an unqualified clean audit opinion on the accounts for the 17th consecutive year. We have delivered the most progressive tax system in the UK and delivered a social security system with fairness at its heart. Re not right now. Research by the Institute for Fiscal Studies published during the Scottish Budget showed that as a result of our decisions, the poorest tenth of Scottish households are set to have incomes £580, 4.6% per year higher than they would under the systems in England or indeed in Wales. We present a draft budget, a draft Scottish budget and budget bill each year to the Parliament for scrutiny, debate and agreement. We engage openly with Parliament on these spending proposals, meeting with um, appropriate members and indeed I'm looking forward to meeting with opposition members in the coming weeks including with Mr Mara who I welcome to his new position and we also work with the parliament and its committees to improve the information available to support its scrutiny of the annual budget. We also publish information on the Scottish budget that is understandable and accessible to a wider audience principally through our Your Scotland Your Finances publication on the Scottish Government website. We seek to be responsive and listening as a government demonstrated through our work with the key stakeholders and structures such as the Equalities and Human Rights Budgetary Advisory Group and Open Government Fiscal Transparency Commitment Group. During each financial year, we also present at least two budget revisions to Parliament 
to agree in-year movements within the Scottish Budget, and these are considered in detail with the, with the Finance and Public Administration Committee. The Finance and Public Administration Committee has also acknowledged improvements in information on this. For example, in March 2022, the convener for the committee, speaking on behalf of the committee, complimented the detail of information provided in the spring budget revision. And I want to put on record my thanks to the committee for the work they do, and also to say that the government will be voting for the amendment in the name of Liz Smith, recognising the important work that the Finance Committee undertakes. And that is because, as a government, on matters of financial transparency, on presenting information as clearly as possible, we will always seek to improve. We will continue to engage on how transparency can be further improved in our accounts, in particular on the points made by Audit Scotland. We are committed to improving the understanding of the public pipe finances and for the public, their representatives and other interested parties, from the revenue we raise to the outcome it achieves. And this is demonstrated through our fiscal transparency programme, which is at its heart, at the heart of the wider commitment to improve fiscal openness and transparency, co-created with civil society partners in Scotland's third Open Government Action Plan. This looks at ways to improve the accessibility of our current fiscal data and information by using more data visualisations, infographics and open data. This commits to improving the accessibility and usability of our data and information on public finances benchmarking our fiscal openness and transparency against international best practice, as well as improving engagement and participation on the public finance. For the officer, this is hard and complex work, complex work, and much of the critical change we want to see will take time. But we will continue to work with the Parliament and civil society partners in this. In conclusion, as a government, we are committed to delivering ongoing budgetary transparency and working with the Parliament, and in particular the Finance Committee, to improve the scrutiny of Scotland's finances. Thank you very much, Minister. And I call on Liz Smith to speak to Move Amendment 866.1, uh, up to four minutes, uh, Ms Smith. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, can I immediately move the amendment in my name? And I'm pleased to hear that the uh, Scottish Government is going to support it because it does raise very specific issues about some of the inconsistencies within the data set uh, that has been uh, used for financial analysis. But can I also unusually perhaps uh, support the Labour motion on this occasion because it's an important motion and that's because um, it's dealing with an extremely important topic about transparency and scrutiny. And in fact, I actually don't see why uh, any MSP would want to oppose that motion because it's essential, most especially in these difficult economic times, that we do everything possible to ensure that we get better value for public money and that we do so in as open and as transparent a manner as possible. And on these uh, benches, we believe that the public deserves no less. They surely have a right to know exactly what their money is being spent on and, just as importantly, why elected members of this place make certain choices. And I think we need to be held fully accountable for every decision we make, most especially when it comes to the public uh, finances. Very quickly, Mr. Uh, Johnson. Daniel Johnson, briefly. Uh, for giving way. As a fellow member of the Finance Committee, albeit I'm just formerly uh, a member, does she... Uh, 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 recognise the characterisation of the, co of the committee's uh, views on transparency as given by the Minister? Listen. Well, I have to say there's a little inconsistency on that, not just about the data, but a little inconsistency on uh, the comments from the Minister. I mean, uh, Mr Johnson has uh, sat on the committee for as long as I have, and I think one of the, the, the important issues, and it's a very important committee of this Parliament for obvious reasons, um, we have raised time and time again the issue about transparency and openness and the ability to scrutinise the numbers um, uh, on a consistent basis. And I think um, Mr. Mario referred to um, some of the lessons that we should have learned before. Some of these lessons actually go further back. I, I can remember uh, the previous uh, Auditor General, Caroline Gardner, talking uh, about exactly this issue, where she was, she was really uh, blaming uh, the, the government, and it wasn't particularly directed uh, just at SNP. It was about... Uh, government in general about the lack of uh, willingness and uh, the, the scrutiny that is essential to make this parliament work effectively. So I think there's a wider issue here, uh, not just about the numbers, and we know the SNP are not very good at numbers just now, but it is about the scrutiny that we need to have to make this parliament work properly. And, you know, just uh, uh, earlier this week, the Finance uh, Committee convener has written uh, to Marie Todd to express the committee's ongoing concerns about the lack of the financial memorandums to support the National uh, Care Service Bill, 
that's just another example of the lack of adequate transparency, which by its very nature prevents the Parliament from engaging in proper scrutiny, and that can't be right. So I'm not really uh, too sure why the SNP amendment should try to place uh, the blame on Westminster, because I, I don't think that's right. Um, Michael Mara cited, I think it was a figure of uh, 3.5 billion um, as, as the failed and profligate spending, and that's a Scottish government failure on Scottish government projects. I don't really see how that is uh, the fault of the UK government. Uh, and uh, do I have time? I can't give you any yeah, extra time, right. I'm afraid. <laughs> can, I, can I just finish on, if I'm drawing my remarks to a, a close, can I just finish on what I think is a very important point, that both openness and transparency are not only good practice to measure best value for taxpayers' money, but also because that openness and that transparency is essential if there is to be renewed trust between government and the public. And there's much media comment just now, obviously, about how politics and government uh, have lost their integrity. And that's not good for society, and it's certainly not good for rebuilding Scotland. Uh, thank you, Ms Smith, and I do apologise, but we are very, very tight for time. And I call uh, Willie Rennie up to four minutes, Mr Rennie. It, it was a commendable straight face from the Minister when he talked about careful budget management. So let's go through some of the, the greatest hits. The troubled GFG, owned by Sanjeev Gupta, duped this SNP government into providing a £586 million guarantee in return for 2,000 jobs. Those jobs have never materialised in Loch Aber, but it was a fantastic picture for the then First Minister and Mr Gupta. £50 million to save 1,500 jobs at Bifab. The money has gone and the jobs have gone. But it was another fantastic photograph with those hard hats and orange jumpsuits. On the hook for millions of pounds for the potential environmental clean-up at the Lanarkshire steel mills if Mr Gupta's empire collapses. Another gritty photograph for the former First Minister in return. And the icing on the cake, or as they say in Port Glasgow, the painted on windows on the ferry. The running sore in our collective bank account, the insult to the workers at Ferguson's, and the agony of the never-ending cancellations on the islands, over budget, over time, and an utter national embarrassment. But boy, it was the best photograph ever. It was such a success that the next lot of ferries are being built in Turkey. This SNP government has been an expensive spin machine from the start. It doesn't do government for the long term. They only do government in their own short-term interests. Public money should be carefully stewarded. It has been hard-earned by people working in shops, in businesses, in schools, in hospitals. But too often, the SNP use it as their plaything for expensive stunts and press releases. It's an embarrassment and it's not a government. What we need instead is change. We need a new economic plan that focuses on long-term progress, not short-term stunts. Our universities are such an economic generator. Global talent working on excellent research. The USA exploits their talent with careful nurturing of intellectual property, a culture of spin-outs, and investment in the best research and best talent. Yet Scotland is slipping. We used to attract 15% of the UK Research Council funding. In the latest round, is only 12.5% because of this government's mismanagement. We need to reverse that decline. Our colleges must be restored to the strength to provide the skilled workforce employers need. The apprenticeship programme must grow to meet the demand and the apprenticeship levy needs to be reformed to incentivise more training, not less. We need the skills landscape. Now, it's been promised for years, but we still don't have it. The renewables potential is huge, but we need a proper plan to rescue the potential of Scotland. Investing in Scottish yards and helping Scottish firms keep the jobs here in Scotland for construction and servicing. 
And to keep the best talent in Scotland, we need to build confidence in the government's taxation policy. It should always be evidence-based, balanced and certain. Prudence should be our watchword. We need good public services to keep us healthy and educated and a clean environment that we can all thrive in. That means expanding early learning and childcare. It means shorter waiting times for mental health treatment and accessing a GP. It means cleaning up the sewage from our rivers. I must ask you to conclude, Mr Rennie. What is essential is we have a plan for the long term, not short term photo ops and stunts. Thank we you, need to Mr Rennie. I must ask you to conclude. Carefully. Thank you. We now move to the open debate, and I would be grateful if all members who wish to speak in the debate were to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Paul O'Kane to be followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to contribute to this important debate and speak in support of the motion in the name of my colleague, uh, Michael Mara. And it is an extremely important and timely debate, and as I think we've already heard uh, from across the Chamber in the opening speeches, we are facing two huge crises here in Scotland. Uh, a cost of living crisis, um, created in part by the Conservative uh, reckless attitude to the economy, and a crisis across our NHS here in Scotland, which I think is widely seen and felt, uh, not just, of course, in our NHS, but I think actually across all of our public services. The reality is that Scotland is being failed by two governments, a Tory government who um, have become morally bankrupt, who have not taken the action that is required to support and protect people, and who have contributed to economic recklessness, which has driven our economy over the cliff edge. And we have an SNP government here in Scotland who have grown bloated, out of touch, and are now mired in their own internal party scandals. And why is this important? Well, it's important, presiding officer, because the people of Scotland are the ones who are being left behind. I want to read a quote to the chamber. I already have days where there is no gas or electricity in the property. We already skip meals and go without basic items. I'm worried that this is going to happen more often and on a lot more days of the month. That testimony is the painful reality felt by thousands of Scots every single day. A new research from the Trussell Trust has revealed that the need for food banks in Scotland has reached its highest ever level. Parents are skipping meals to ensure that they can feed their children. However, this issue did not rise solely out of a cost of living crisis. The Trussell Trust have concluded that neither the COVID pandemic nor the cost of living crisis are the key drivers in the need for food banks. I think we all know that they are symptomatic of wider issues and a wider deep endemic poverty that pervades in Scotland and has not been sufficiently addressed across our communities. Indeed, people who already are already in poverty have been pushed to the margins and are being ignored by both governments, both at Westminster and at Holyrood. In Scotland, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation has found that 460,000 people are now living in very deep poverty, a figure which has significantly increased across two decades. Making poverty history in Scotland will be central to everything we do. Those were the words of the then Deputy First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, in 2008. Of course, that aspiration of making poverty history is something that every single person in this chamber should share. But, presiding officer, it is one thing to say it and another to focus all of your attention and resource of government to do something about making it a reality. 16 years in power. Child poverty remains at the same level when this government took power. They have had 16 years with the access to the levers of power to make fundamental change. But the reality is that since entering government in 2007, the SNP has failed to address the issues in a serious, substantive manner, and that is why we are seeing these issues. And of course, as we've already heard, this has been at the backdrop also of a Conservative government at a UK level who have made matters worse. So the reality is we do need change, presiding officer. We need a Labour government at a UK level who will invest in a meaningful windfall tax, who will take action on the cost of living, who will support families across the country. And we need change with a Labour government here at Holyrood, who would reprioritise, move away from waste, move away from government bloat, and find the, the triggers and the levers and use them to make a difference. Next week, we will participate in the Poverty Summit, which was announced by the First Minister, and we do welcome action, any action, addressing poverty. But let's be clear, this is yet another summit, and there have been many summits. And it cannot be another talking shop. 
because the SNP has failed over the 16 years, despite all of their encouraging positive rhetoric, all of their photo ops, to effectively use the power of this parliament, the parliament we created, to make tackling poverty a top policy priority. In concluding, presiding officer, after 16 years, people need less talk and more action from this government. Thank you. And I call John Mason to be followed by Jamie Halker Johnston. Hey, thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to speak in today's debate, which gives us the chance to contrast Labour's management of finance in comparison to the SNP's. And of course, we can look at the Conservatives as well. In the first place, I'm willing to accept that almost every individual and every organisation makes mistakes and wastes money at times. Who of us has never bought food that we did not eat or bought clothes that we seldom wear? The Edinburgh trams cost far too much, although that was a decision forced on the SNP by other parties. And the ferries clearly have not been a total success story, although if the Scottish Government had not intervened, presumably Ferguson's would now be completely closed and with it commercial shipbuilding on the Clyde. I assume that is not what Labour is arguing for. And let's look at other capital projects which have been incredibly successful. For example, the Queensferry Crossing was originally costed at some three to four billion pounds and actually cost 1.4 billion pounds. Prestwick Airport remains open and is operating profitably, whereas without Scottish Government, it would presumably have closed and with it would have gone some 2,000 jobs. Then we come to revenue spending. We see some considerable SNP successes, including the Scottish Child Payment, lifting 50,000 children out of poverty, 1140 hours of early learning and childcare for all three and four-year-olds, not to mention free prescriptions, free personal care, and the continuation of no student tuition fees. Now, of course, when it comes to labour, we do not actually know what their policies are. Both Keir Starmer and Anna Sarwar have been very policy light. It seems they want to avoid real policies or commitments, which they could eventually be held to account for. And nothing in their motion for today says anything about different decisions Labour would have made. For example, I'm sorry, it's a four-minute debate. There's no time. Labour chose the four-minute debate. A, would Labour have made different decisions about Prestwick and Ferguson's and allowed them both to close? But what we do know is what Labour has done in the past when they had their hands on the purse strings. In Glasgow, they failed to settle the equal pay claims of female staff and allowed the liability to run up year after year. Only when the SNP came to power and settled the claims did we discover the kind of bill that Labour had run up, £770 million. And then how about Labour's building of this Scottish Parliament building? The initial cost, estimated by Donald Dewar, was 30 to 40 million pounds. The actual final cost was 414 million pounds. Was that competence in management? Another for Labour, how about the PFI schemes? Construction costs of some 5.6 billion for schools, hospitals, etc. Mr. Mason, could you just give me a moment, please? Um, there are conversations happening across the aisles. I would be grateful if members could desist. Mr. Mason, please continue. I'm glad I'm kind of stirring them up a bit. A construction cost of some £5.6 billion for schools, hospitals, etc., but our local councils and health boards are now having to pay back over five times that, and it is rising with inflation, with some £15 billion still outstanding. Was that competence in management? And last time I looked, Labour continues to support nuclear weapons, £167 billion, according to Reuters, for the upcoming submarine programme. Is that really a priority when ordinary people in the east end of Glasgow are facing a cost of living crisis? And before the Conservatives start feeling too pleased with themselves, what was the cost of hiring boats which did not exist? £13 million. And how is HS2 going? The Euston Tunnel is being delayed indefinitely, with the likely cost having risen for that tunnel from £2.6 billion to £4.8 billion. And the overall project cost up from £72 billion to £98 billion. I just hate to think where Scotland would be now if Labour had been running the show for the last 16 years. Thank you. Thank you. I call Jamie Halker johnston to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This is an important debate, and it is timely given the myriad of claims and accusations which face both the Scottish Government and the party that leads it. Transparency and accountability in government should be a core principle of government, that decisions are made in an open manner, and when things go wrong, that there is a clear record of how decisions were made and who was responsible for making them. 
But that's not how this government works. And accountability appears a foreign concept to SNP ministers. It wasn't always like this. In 2010, the then Transport Minister, Stuart Stevenson, fell on his sword because it was the right thing to do. Fast forward to 2023, and we have a Scottish Government where no one has paid the price for the disastrous ferries procurement scandal. And we have a Government happy to hold important meetings without minuting them, and which are forced to scrabble around searching for those minutes they did have. Those unfinished ferries are just one example of a government as transparent as a black hole, where decisions were made for political reasons, and millions of pounds of taxpayers' cash has been wasted by the SNP on buying what must be the most expensive pre-conference headlines ever. The ferry scandal by Fab Presswick Airport, all examples of a government not only making dubious investment decisions, but making them behind closed doors, and then defending them from behind a smokescreen. And in my region, the Highlands and Islands, as Willie Rennie mentioned, the SNP government's dealing with Sanjeev Gupta and the GFG alliance over the aluminium smelter in Lakaba are another example of how this gov government often operates in the shadows. Scottish ministers have time and time again hidden behind commercial confidentiality to avoid questions on this deal. A deal which saw over half a billion pounds of taxpayers' money put at risk, where promised new jobs have failed to appear and where millions of pounds worth of assets were signed over to a business which is now being investigated for fraud and whose auditors resigned last year. Sounds familiar. But why, do we, why would we expect anything less from this SNP-led government? A lack of openness is endemic in their party. Is it any wonder that a party for which transparency and accountability are such alien concepts has formed a government in its own image? Presiding officer, the SNP have claimed to have spent three billion tackling the cost of living crisis, but Spice have estimated the SNP have spent less than 20% of that figure, with most of that coming from the UK government. They've claimed to have increased support to Scotland's council, but Scotland's councils have rubbished this. They've even claimed Scottish GDP has grown more than UK GDP, when they've actually presided over GDP growth, which has lagged behind the rest of the UK, and allied themselves with a party that doesn't even believe in GDP in the first place. And the SNP have claimed in their amendment today that Scotland has, and I quote, the most progressive income tax system in the UK. Minister, there's nothing progressive about making Scotland the most taxed part of the United Kingdom. Nor in an approach which, according to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, could see Scotland's 2024-25 budget reduced by 732 million as a result of lower than expected tax receipts in 2021-2022, meaning even more financial pressure is put on public services. But I am grateful for the Minister for giving us all a good laugh today. I can picture him sitting in St Andrew's house, surrounded by his advisers, instructing them to put, in a line, put a line in their motion about this SNP Green Government being open, transparent and competent. It's good to see the Minister hasn't lost his sense of humour. But I'm afraid Scotland doesn't see the funny side of 16 years of SNP incompetence. After 16 years of SNP mismanagement of funds, and where the only thing transparent about this new, uh, this SNP government is its contempt for public accountability. Thank you. Thank you. I call Pauline McNeill to be followed by Ivan McKee. As someone who has fought hard for this devolved parliament, I do care how it looks 20 plus years on. But how it looks right now to most people is that the current procedures are failing to help keep this government to account. On one of the areas that Scottish Labour believes needs change is that presiding officers should have more powers to compel more accurate answers from ministers where necessary instead of the self-policing circus where ministers can avoid answering questions or in fact provide inaccurate and inadequate answers. And the only current route for politicians right now, I know a matter the presiding officer is concerned about, is points of order. The current framework is not fit for purpose and it must change if you care about this parliament at all. There is a pressing duty for this government to change the quality of parliamentary answers, but also to change course under poor financial management and commit to a culture of openness and transparency, and one which shows taxpayers clearly how all of their money is allocated and spent. More so now than ever, because ordinary people, as Michael Mara has said, question more than ever as they see the party of government laid bare in recent weeks and in scenes which have rocked the governing party to their core. 
Unfortunately, it has impacted on the standing of this parliament and its reputation. So I say now that the SNP owe it to the people of Scotland to overhaul their approach to openness and accountability in this parliament and in its finances. But a culture of secrecy in Scotland's finances developed in the Scottish Government for far too long. Now, the words I'm quoting here are from Spice and from Audit Scotland, who have, complete, have repeatedly called on the SNP to improve transparency and accountability. And in recent years, the Finance and Public Administration Committee have also urged the Government to improve budget transparency. And when the Scottish Government published its resource spending review in May 2022, it committed to publishing details around planning for public service reform, including the direction of travel for public sector employment. However, these expected plans have had a notable omission from this year's budget, again a barrier to parliamentary scrutiny. As has been said already, the Scottish Government, public, uh, public sector it accounts for £22 billion of the budget, and not having a steer on pay parameters does lead people to question why the government were not open in the first place, given we have had over a decade of wage stagnation, and the unions and the public want to know where the government stand on their allocation of budget for something so important to the people of Scotland. Is anyone interested in a higher standard of parliamentary scrutiny, a human rights budgeting approach, Transparency means that we have to do an awful lot better than we are faced with right now. Within the main budget documentation for this year, there is little comment or description on the data underpinning budget decisions or how the decisions impact on different groups of people. There is no accompanying documents aimed specifically at accessibility with a simple breakdown of the budget and many of the supporting documents are not linked and are hard to find on the website. As a parliament, we have to do better, and the government needs to do better. The Scottish Government needs to do more to improve the quality and transparency of its financial performance and reporting. Um, and in fact, um, one example in my own portfolio that I cover in justice is that the, the rolling out of body-worn cameras is a fundamental requirement, I think, in police accountability. And we can't really see enough as to whether or not we could have taken the earlier decisions to make this rollout happen quicker. And now we're the only force in the UK that will not have the full use of body-worn cameras. It is time for change. The over-secretive approach of the government... I must ask you to conclude, Ms McNeill. Sorry, right. I couldn't see the clock. I'll conclude on that to say the Scottish Government must be more open and more accountable for the sake of the people of Scotland. Thank you. And I call Ivan McKee to be followed by Ross Greer. Uh, thank you, President Austin. I want to take this opportunity to highlight some positive aspects of the Scottish Government's stewardship of the nation's finances, but also to identify opportunities for improvement. A few points. First of all, all organisations suffer from inefficiencies, and my colleague John Mason has given some excellent examples. Another, of course, is hundreds of millions on questionable PPE contracts from the UK Government contrasted with the Scottish Government's rapid and cost-effective deployment of locally manufactured PPE. Secondly, all organisations have opportunities for improvement. No matter how good you think you are, you can always do better. An area I have some familiarisation with from my previous life as a turnaround professional, taking poorly performing organisations, dramatically improving service delivery and doing so at substantially lower cost through creating continuous improvement cultures that value employees and a knowledge of how best to do the job delegating responsibility beyond layers of ineffective management, combined with modern structured improvement methodologies and adoption of latest technologies, very much aligned with the Christie principles, participation, empowerment, partnership, prevention, and reducing duplication. One of the core arguments, presiding officer, in favour of independence is that smaller countries are more agile, nimble, responsive to opportunities, and more efficient at service delivery, benefiting from shorter lines from or through organisations to service users. This is demonstrably true and is one of the reasons why smaller countries benefit from an average growth rate 0.7% higher than larger comparable neighbours. To persuade people of the benefits of independence, we need to demonstrate that we can run efficient, high-quality public services within budget. Scotland's health service, for example, does performance better than its UK counterpart on many measures, but of course much more needs to be done. Health is one area where organisational complexity, scope for technology adoption and leverage and preventative 
uh, efforts spent offer significant scope for improved delivery within budget. And I and my colleagues will be producing a paper shortly to give more details and our thoughts on this. There are some clear examples of where we need to do better. Our service delivery mechanisms are overcomplicated, with more than 100 public bodies, much overlap and duplication, zero management overheads and systems, and complex interfaces. Government finds comfort in talking about inputs. There is no easier headline than creating a new fund or a new organisation to deliver it. All that does, of course, is create more complexity and cost in the system, reducing the amount of money that finds its way to those who need it. The Scottish Government annual spend on core civil services is now more than £700 million, with significant increases in recent years. Alignment of workforce and budget controls fall short of best practice. It's worth noting that the majority of the additional revenue from raised from this year's tax rise, tax rate rises will be spent funding increases in Scottish Government civil service costs. The adoption of hybrid working has rightly led to an over-provision of real estate and the scope for significant cost reduction here needs to be realised as leases expire. The construction of new premises, for example, the proposed Glasgow hub, seems in that context a misuse of scarce capital resources. The Scottish Government should also take forward at pace the creation of the Victoria Key Tech and Creative Hub, making use of redundant government-owned estate to boost local economies and national clusters. The public sector reform agenda is important. The work on culture change, empowerment and adopting best practice and modern technology within government itself is critical. The external expert advisory group has significant value here, so I'm concerned by reports that the DFM has delegated engaging with this group to officials. In conclusion, President Officer, what my constituents want to see is the money getting to the front line and delivering high-quality, cost-effective services, not being swallowed up in organisational complexities before it gets there. There are literally hundreds of millions to be redirected in that regard, and I have every confidence that the Scottish Government will deliver on that agenda. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Ross Greer to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm grateful to Michael Mara for using one of his party's business slots to give Parliament time to consider the challenges of managing our public finances during a cost of living crisis. As others have already said, fiscal sustainability is a major area of interest for our Finance and Public Administration Committee and, of course, for the Scottish Fiscal Commission. On one level, fiscal sustainability in a devolved context should be pretty simple. We don't have the option of running a deficit. We can't accumulate debt like a normal national government. But the considerable constraints on our financial powers and on the budget available to us create serious challenges of their own. Investing in infrastructure is one of the most effective ways to spread economic prosperity. But Scotland's capital budget has been cut significantly by the UK government, and we do not have the meaningful capital borrowing powers which any normal nation would have for exactly this kind of investment. The effect of that lack of funding has both short and long-term impacts. A group of MSPs from the Greens, Labour, the SNP and the Conservatives met last month with Jubilee Scotland to discuss the impact of private financing of public infrastructure under the PFI model. I have not got the time to go into the detail of that here, though I would commend to members the latest report from the Scotland Against Public-Private Partnerships campaign. And I hope that through the Scottish National Investment Bank and other pathways, we will be able to make progress on providing far better value for the public purse in the future than has been the case with PFIs. But in the context of the review of the fiscal framework between the Scottish and UK governments and the development of the new framework between Scottish government and local government, I hope we can build a consensus across Parliament on the need for greater direct capital borrowing powers to sit here and for some further reform of the borrowing powers available to local councils. That review of the fiscal framework needs to deliver significant reforms beyond just borrowing powers, though. The operation of the Scottish Reserve, for example, is absurdly limited. The £700 million overall limit, the £250 million resource drawdown limit and the £100 million capital drawdown limit are all entirely arbitrary numbers and they now reflect a far, far smaller proportion of the overall budget than when they were originally agreed. Reform of the reserve should be obvious and I hope it will be a source of consensus rather than contention between the Scottish and UK governments. On a somewhat related note to the operation of the reserve, one other area where change is needed for the sake of transparency and public understanding is reporting and discussion of our annual underspend. Not because there's anything inherently wrong with the Auditor General's reports on that in particular, but because they're clearly and consistently being misunderstood. And let's be honest, some of that is pretty willful. This is politics. But if we take the 21-22 uh, budget as the most recent example, the reported figure of £2 billion was repeatedly uh, claimed and, and resulted in claims being made that there was a £2 billion pot of cash which went untouched for some 
deliberate but unexplained reason, which could therefore be spent in the year 22-23, when the reality is that much of that underspend was technical. It was the result of a variation in the student loans market, which the Audit Scotland report made clear in the very next line did not actually mean there was cash left over. Much of the rest was one-off ring-fenced COVID funds, which couldn't be entirely spent on time for reasons that we all understand, and funds for specific projects, which were also delayed by the pandemic, meaning that the money wasn't literally going unspent. The spending was just being rolled into the next financial year because it couldn't literally be delivered in that one. Despite all of that, I lost count of the number of teachers I spoke to during their pay dispute who couldn't understand why we weren't making a higher offer to them because they'd heard that we had an extra £2 billion in the bank just sitting there, unused. Communicating that nuance is a challenge for Audit Scotland, for the Scottish Government and for Parliament. Openness and transparency in the handling of public finances is of critical importance to every nation and the work of our Parliament's Finance Committee has demonstrated that there is much here which we can find consensus on. This afternoon's debate hasn't quite hit on that consensus to the same extent, but there have been a number of really strong points made. That's politics. But I hope that through the committee system in particular and other avenues, we'll continue making that progress on our financial governance, which is so essential to maintaining the public's trust with what is ultimately their money. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Marie McNair. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to this debate, which serves as an important reminder of the responsibility of all governments to spend public money as effectively as possible. Today's motion is right to speak about the waste we have seen over the last 16 years of government and of the failed financial interventions we have also seen throughout that time. On this, we have already heard today about the hundreds of millions of pounds wasted on two ferries, which have yet to tee active service. Indeed, the final cost of these ferries is yet known and continues to rise. I have also spoken before about the SNP's failure to properly use financial levers of power it holds, such as these over income tax. The SNP's amendment today mentions proudly talking about Scotland having the most progressive income tax system in the United Kingdom. The truth, however, is that the SNP's decision to hike taxes for 2023-24 will mean Scots are paying massively in additional taxes to higher rates and lower thresholds. As an ally say, we have seen from the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission shows the result will just mean that £325 million in additional revenues due to the lower earnings and employment growth compared to the rest of the United Kingdom. My colleague Liv Smith uh, challenged the First Minister on this issue just last week and was told that detailed analysis has been carried out on all tax-related decisions when it comes to the justification of these tax policies, which ultimately risk slower growth and lower tax takes revenue. It is unclear about that detailed analysis and as in what it looks like. This is just the latest example of this government failing to truly be transparent when it comes to their finances. The other financial burdens we've heard, and from memory, include £30 million spent last year on the census. This is not the first time that the SNP insists on doing something different that ends up costing the Scottish taxpayer. Examples of all kinds of financial mismanagement have been found in every year this government has been in power. This government's mismanagement of public money is far from something of the past. It is still very much ongoing, presiding officer. Despite many stakeholders' opposition to their plans, the SNP are still pushing forward with their national care service. This will cost an additional £1.6 billion at the worst possible time. This funding will be much better spent on overstretched local care services instead. They need that money and they need it now. While we already heard that plans of that have been kicked further down the road, it's still the case that the SNP will not scrap plans and waste money continually. So in conclusion, presiding officer, it is perhaps no surprise that the SNP have come to this chamber and attempted to paint a very different picture of the government's record when it comes to Scotland's finances. The main issue and the main thrust of their amendment appears to be nothing to see here. Absolutely nothing to see here. However, as today's motion sets out, the truth is far less convincing for this government. Holding the financial levers of power is a tremendous responsibility for any government. It is high time that this Green SNP government recognised this and started taking its responsibilities much more seriously for the people of Scotland. Thank you. And I call Marie McNair, the final speaker in the open debate. 
Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate in support of the amendment in the name of Tom Arthur. There is no doubt that there, this is very difficult times for uh, public finances in Scotland. In the Tories crashing of the economy and the disastrous Brexit, and now also the policy of a Labour colleague's opposite, are stretching budgets to the limit. Inflation has rocketed, and as well as affecting government budget, it is having a terrible impact on our constituents. Food inflation is at an astonishing 19.2 per cent, the highest level in 45 years. The Scottish Government, in the face of this challenge, have set balanced budgets and invested in supporting many policies to assist during these very difficult times. Unlike south of the border, people in Scotland can claim the Scottish Child Payment, have access to free prescriptions, pay no tuition fees and have lower council tax bills. Some of these policies Labour apparently previously labelled as a something-for-nothing country. This was because they did not have the vision and compassion to recognise that these policies were crucial in keeping many households afloat. Higher pay offers for teachers in Scotland and increased investment in education from the SNP government mean spending per pupil is now over 18 per cent higher than Tory-run England and Labour-run Wales, who spend just uh, 7,200 per pupil compared to over 8,500 in Scotland. It is correct that we need to continue to deliver budgets that allow this investment to continue, and that is what we will see from this government. We can contrast this with Labour's record, because we know that Labour's budget competence and stewardship of the economy, they confirmed their incompetence in writing. And we all remember the letter left by the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Liam Byrne, when Labour were removed from office. It said, Dear Chief Secretary, I am afraid there is no money. Kind regards and good luck, Liam. Some of us are old enough to remember the record in government in both Scotland and the UK. OK, President Officer, all of us are uh, old enough to remember that. Uh, and they're even still paying for their record. Their disastrous PVP Let's hear Ms McNair, please. costing Scottish uh, taxpayers a £30 billion repayment bill, forcing us all to pay many times more than the original cost of the projects. It's estimated there are still £15 billion to pay for this economic madness. And also, don't forget the millions of pounds they took away in supporting people grants uh, from charities and third sector organisations in Western Bartonshire. I'll never forget that. And my Glasgow colleague, John Mason, uh, has reminded us of Labour's refusal to pay the equal pay to working women in the city. Absolutely shame. And unpaid carers will not forget Labour's record either. Since 1976, when it was initially introduced as Invalid Care Allowance, Successive UK governments refused to align the amount paid with other earning replacement benefits. This Parliament needed to step in to right this wrong, a wrong that is owned jointly by the Labour Party and the Tories. And since, since launching it in 2018, a total of 833,425 carers allowance supplement payments have been paid to 141,565 carers, totalling £231.8 million, another cost of mitigating labour and Tory failure. Think of where that money could have been spent. We, we can't rely on pro-Brexit and the austerity Labour Party to put people of Scotland first. And the Tory-inflicted cost of living crisis tells its own story about their incompetence, unprecedented since records began. Instead, it will be down to this Scottish Government to manage our budgets carefully, set progressive rates of taxation within our powers and continue to invest in crucial services for the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to closing speeches and I call on Murdo Fraser. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Well, um, I fear Michael Mara was enjoying himself just a little bit too much at the start of this uh, debate, trolling the SNP front benches about their party finances. But at least uh, Tom Arthur has, has uh, demonstrated he has a sense of humour. As Jimmy Halper Johnson mentioned earlier, his amendment talking about, uh, and I quote, unqualified accounts, close quote, and openness, transparency, incompetence. I assume his tongue was firmly in his cheek when he drafted uh, those words. And I'm surprised that no well-paid spad or civil servant didn't say, Minister, do you not think that wording is just a little bit courageous? given current, current uh, events. But uh, Michael Mara was, was right uh, to highlight 
uh, the lack of transparency in relation to this government's financial decision making. And don't just take the words of the opposition uh, for, for, for that. Uh, Liz Smith quoted the previous Auditor General Caroline Gardner back in 2021, uh, raising her concerns about transparency in providing loans to private companies. Stephen Boyle, the current uh, Auditor General in December of 2022, produced a report asking for more transparency in four respects. Firstly, fully costing spending commitments and reporting them clearly in budgets. Secondly, greater transparency over capital borrowing plans and how they apply to projects. Thirdly, more transparency over how reserves are used to help manage cost pressures. And fourthly, increasing transparency within the accounts uh, around the balances held within the Scotland Reserve. Four areas where the Auditor General has called for greater transparency. But it doesn't stop there, Presiding Officer, because even within the Scottish National Party, we see criticism. Kenneth Gibson, convener of the Finance Committee, who I don't think is in the chamber this afternoon, uh, writing, uh, I read just today, uh, on behalf of the committee, who they are, uh, and I quote, increasingly concerned over the lack of information over the financial implications of the National Care uh, Service Bill. A flagship policy of the SNP and no financial memorandum to accompany it. Absolutely extraordinary from a government that tells us it believes in transparency. And yet, uh, the Minister for Public Finance tells us that this Scottish Government prioritises openness, transparency and competence in the management of Scotland's finances. Well, the evidence, I have to say, tells us something different. And then we heard from a number of, of members who highlighted the wastage in government. Uh, Willie Rennie, amongst others, Bifab, Prestwick Airport, Ferguson Marine, £300 million and upwards and still no ferries being delivered and our island communities let down. And yet we learned just uh, the other week that Pentland Ferries are now loaning the MV Alfred from the Orkney route to Calmac to help service some of the communities in the, in the West Coast who have been let down for a cool £1 million a month. £1 million a month. Nice work if you can get it. For a ferry which costs £17 million to purchase. Now I make that uh, an annualised return on investment of 71%. 71% Pentland Ferries will be laughing all the way to the bank, presiding officer, at the expense of the Scottish taxpayer. I would think the Minister for Public Finance should be just a little bit embarrassed at the deal he struck there, or his colleague struck there, for the Scottish taxpayer. And then we have the guarantees to Sanjeev Gupta and the GFG group for the Fort William uh, smelter, adding up in total to three and a half billion pounds wasted just so the Scottish Government could get some nice photo opportunities. That's not the way you steward the public finances, presiding officer. Presiding officer, my time is very short. Trust in politics is important. That applies to the finances of political parties as it applies to the finances of government. But governments are using public money, yep. and that's why they have to demonstrate a proper record of transparency. It's not happening at the moment. That needs to change. And the complacent approach we've heard so far from the government front bench really has to be improved upon. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Shirley Ann Somerville, Cabinet Secretary, up to four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And in the midst of a cost crisis exacerbated by economic mismanagement by the UK Government and facing the most complex and difficult budget in the history of devolved Parliament, this Government is using the powers it has to tackle inequality and poverty. And we are a government that is focused on equality, opportunity and community and making a real difference to people's lives. On equality, we will continue to tackle poverty in all its forms and we will substantially reduce child poverty. On opportunity, we will use all the powers we have to their maximum effect to support economic growth, to help businesses and trade to thrive and to maximise the opportunity for a fair green economy. And on community, we are focusing on the delivery of key public services. Now, this Scottish Government recognises the pressure on household budgets, which is why last year and this, we have allocated almost £3 billion to support policies which tackle poverty and support people during the ongoing cost of living crisis. This Government's second Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan, Best Start Bright Futures, reaffirms our sharp focus on working with partners to support those at greatest, need, uh, at greatest risk of poverty. 
Now, the plan commits to wide-ranging and ambitious action to provide immediate support to families and deliver transformational change in the longer term to break the cycle of child poverty in Scotland. This includes, of course, Social Security Scotland, now delivering 13 Scottish Government benefits, including winter heating payment, which launched in February this year. Seven of those benefits are entirely new forms of financial support only available in Scotland. This, of course, also includes the game-changing Scottish Child Payment. It took 18 months from inception to delivery, and that's unprecedented, and no benefit in the UK has ever been delivered so quickly. It is a response to the cost of living crisis, of course, as well. And last year, we increased this payment by 150% within eight months, from £10 to £25 per week per eligible child under 16. This is making a real difference for children and families. In 2023-24, we're investing £5.2 billion in benefits expenditure, supporting over 1 million people. This is, 770, this is £770 million above the level of funding forecast to be received by the UK Government through the block grant adjustments. This money will go directly to people who need it most and will support households on low incomes, carers and help for disabled people living independent lives. And of course, in April, we also uprated all Scottish benefits in line with inflation by 10.1%. This is all being delivered by this government within our fixed budget and limited powers. Shows the political choices that we are making to support people and show that we are making significant investment in the people of Scotland. That also includes, of course, offering free school lunches during term time to over 280,000 pupils in primaries one to five. It includes maintaining our investment in the Scottish Welfare Fund it includes continuing to invest in discretionary housing payments. It includes our continued investment in free bus travel, now applying to over 2 million people, including all children and young people under, 20, uh, under 22. It includes £350 million a year to deliver the council tax reduction scheme. And of course, it includes our support for carers' allowance. Now, we have heard a great deal, presiding officer, from the opposition parties. And opposition debate speeches come without cost. But if also opposition parties are also seriously wishing to engage in the Scottish Government on practical, costed proposals, then our door is always open. But if not, presiding officer, this is unfortunately yet another afternoon that we have spent listening to hot air and nothing more. In the meantime, this Government will get on delivering for the people of Scotland. Yeah. Thank you. And I call on Daniel Johnston. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Let me... Uh, pick up just where the Cabinet Secretary left off, because if I'm not mistaken, if she's wanting practical solutions, let's look no further than £12 an hour for social care workers, a pledge not just adopted by Kate Forbes, but now a pledge from the current First Minister. So if our suggestions are so impractical, so wildly uh, uh, unaffordable, why are they being adopted by her own government. Frankly, the statement she just made lacks any form of credibility, and she knows fine well it's not a fixed budget. Because this government controls income tax, it controls uh, 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 other levies, it has a variable budget, it can't change it within a year, yes, but it is not true to say that it is a fixed budget. But perhaps most I, I need to make some progress, Mr. Beer, I apologise. But perhaps the most interesting uh, point of difference uh, in this debate didn't come from the opposition benches, I think it came from Ivan McKee, because I agree with him. We do need a lean government, an agile government, a government using best technology. But that's not what we have. No. If you contrast what he was saying with the account that we had of, from Tom Arthur, that everything is fine, everything is best practice, I think it showed a level of complacency which actually stands at odds with what this government needs to do and what it needs to embrace. It stands at odds with even the most recent findings from Audit Scotland. Where, uh, within their net zero uh, 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 report that they just published, where they said that there was ill-defined goals, ill-defined lines of accountability and overlapping responsibilities leading to poor outcomes. Now, I would suggest that if government listened a little bit more to people like Ivan McKee, they'd do a little less of the things that they currently are doing, as evidenced by that net zero paper. And it's perhaps why Ivan McKee was pushed out, because those challenging voices are not ones that this government can tolerate. 
Because that's what goes to heart what this debate is really about. Because a government that makes progress needs to be honest about mistakes. It needs to be honest about where it needs to make improvements and needs to be honest about the challenges that it faces. But that's not what this government's interested in. And you only need to look at, at, at as far as the recent cabinet reshuffle. Now, this government, in its infancy as it, as it may be, is remarkable for very few things. It can't even claim the prize for self-inflicted crisis and disaster. No, that, that prize goes to Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss. No, the only thing it's remarkable for is its sheer size. A government that has doubled. A government that now almost 20% of parliamentarians sit on the government front benches. And most of us don't even qualify. Almost half the SNP group, and I would look to those members sitting across there. If you're not on the government benches, you might need to ask yourself why you've been overlooked. This is ridiculous. In the UK, the number of ministers is capped. And yet in the Scottish government, the Scottish Parliament, the SNP, seem to ever uh, grow those numbers. And it makes for bad government, because we know what it's about. It's about increasing the payroll vote because it's part of a wider pattern. What this government is about is about in uh, increasing its level of control, increasing secrecy, control of the narrative, but that ultimately leads to bad decision-making and waste. Let me quote someone. We need to create a leaner, more efficient government that is focused on delivering results and cutting waste. Not my words, but from their first first minister. And I know they don't like quoting their previous first ministers, but he was right, wasn't he? But it's not just ministers where this government is going wrong. On quangos, again, do we remember the bonfire of the quangos? But since that was uttered, the number of quangos has increased. There's been a 29% increase in the number of executive board members and 223 new positions created by the Scottish Government, taking the total number of those positions to 774. There are people now whose job description, whose description of what they do professionally on LinkedIn is a professional public board member. But when you have so many in such a small country, of course you need people to double up. But it is a sign of waste. It is a sign of confused uh, 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 objectives. And it is ultimately about outsourcing and abdicating responsibility, but it ultimately leads to bad outcomes uh, for the public uh, and the public purse. Now, Scott Labour have uh, also published, uh, uh, just last year, £3.7 billion worth of government waste under this budget. And that's not a, a, an exhaustive list. For example, it doesn't even include Angus Robertson's travel uh, budget. Uh, but what it does, and the thread that runs through all of the issues that, that have been indicated, is a, a poor, poor planning and poor objectives. Whether it's the spiralling costs through the a, a complete inability of this government to implement a workforce strategy, which resulting in a delayed discharge spiralling out of control and hundreds of millions of pounds spent on agency spend through to, and I couldn't have put it better than Willie Rennie did, the greatest hits of uh, 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 transport disasters and industrial interventions. Please and conclude, is, Mr Johnson. He is absolutely right in his analysis because it's driven by that same culture of secrecy, about putting politics over delivery, and it's why this government needs to go. We need a government that is focused on, on the key issues, housing, skills, and industrial strategy, but ultimately delivery over spin, which is something this government is incapable of doing. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Scotland's finances and the cost of living. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion 8663, in the name of Sue Webber, on the appointment of the Commissioner for Children and Young People in Scotland. And I call on Sue Webber to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the selection panel. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the cross-party selection panel established by the Presiding Officer under our standing orders, I am delighted to be speaking to the motion in my name to invite members of the Parliament to agree to nominate Nicola Colleen to His Majesty the King for appointment as the Commissioner for Children and Young People in Scotland. The presiding officer chaired the selection panel and the other members were Bob Doris, Colcab Stewart and Martin Whitfield. As part of the recruitment process, in addition to being interviewed by the cross-party panel, the candidates were also interviewed by a panel of young advisers who had collaborated with children on setting the questions the candidates were to be asked. 
Our thanks go to all of those involved, and in particular to Megan, aged 11, and Sandy, aged 10, for their particularly challenging questions. We had the pleasure of meeting the young advisers and getting their feedback on the candidates, which was an invaluable uh, part of the process. And on behalf of the panel, I would like to thank them all very much for their time and commitment and for their absolute excellent feedback. And I'm delighted that one of the advisers is in the chamber this afternoon watching this debate. As members might be aware, the role of the Commissioner is to promote and safeguard the rights of children and young people in Scotland. In particular, the Commissioner must pr promote awareness and understanding of the rights of children and young people, keep under review the law, policy and practice relating to the rights of children and young people, promote best practice by service providers and publish research. The Commissioner also has powers to investigate some issues affecting children's human rights. Turning to the panel's nominee, who is in the chamber with her family, Nicola is the Chief Executive Officer of Systema Scotland, which delivers a social change programme called Big Noise in five cities across Scotland, using music and nurturing relationships to support over 3,500 children and young people. I am sure a number of members will have engaged with Systema and know of its very valued work in their communities. Their newest project is in Wester Hales, and I have seen firsthand the benefit their work has brought to that community, and I'm hoping to visit them again very soon. Nicola graduated from the Royal Society, Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama, with a degree in music education, and has a particular focus throughout her career in creating opportunities for children and young people from more disadvantages, disadvantaged communities. The panel believes that Nicola's blend of skills, knowledge, experience and commitment to children and young people will make her an excellent Commissioner. Lastly, I would like to mention the outgoing Commissioner Bruce Adamson, who has served since 2017. Bruce has had a considerable impact as the Commissioner and I am sure we would all like to thank him for his many achievements during his term of office and to wish him very best for the future. Presiding Officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 8701 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak on the motion, and the question is that motion 8701 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motions 8702 on stage one extension and 8703 on stage two timetable. And I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motions to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motions. Thank you again, President Officer, and both moved. Thank you. No member has asked to speak against the motions. Therefore, the question is that motions 8702 and 8703 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motions are therefore agreed. There are seven questions to be put as a result of today's business. And the first is that amendment 8685.2 in the name of Paul McLennan, which seeks to amend motion 8685 in the name of Mark Griffin on homelessness prevention and housing supply be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.